All right. So, yes, we're going to, oh, and I forgot to update the date and time. I told you that this is not going to be the best lecture, but we will try. Um, so we were talking about this really cool technique of write-ahead logging. The main reason why we like write-ahead logging, of course, is that we can have multiple concurrent transactions in flight. That was what sort of made it nicer than shadow copies and so forth. But we still have this characteristic that I can do atomicity and durability by writing a commit record to my log. And once I sync that record to the log on disk, then I know that the transaction is committed. Because the log records all the state changes of the transaction, and therefore I can always recover it if I need to, if the system crashes before all the table data has actually necessarily made it to the disk. Okay, so we talked about that. Um, there's a few other details as well. I'm going to um, skip over some of this just for the sake of time. But the write-ahead logging rule is extremely important that I have to make sure the write-ahead log reflects all changes to table pages before we make them. And that sounds a little bit weird. Um, you might think, well, wh where all does this apply? And the reality is you could conceivably change table pages in memory before you have corresponding log records for them. In fact, that's almost always the way that it works. We make changes to table pages in memory in the buffers before we've created the write-ahead log records for them. But we absolutely make sure that the write-ahead log records always make it to disk before the table pages get written to disk. And if we always make sure to follow that rule, then our write-ahead logging rule is satisfied. And that way we can always make sure that we can either reproduce or unroll whatever changes we make to table data on disk. And so that's why this all works. Okay? Um, you'll have a good assignment to actually explore these, these issues, so I'm not too worried about if you understand it super well right now, but you'll get to explore some of these things in the future. Now we talked about recovery, and recovery has two phases that roughly correspond to the two things that need to happen in the database, in recovery processing in general. One is that we need to get the table files in sync with the write-ahead log. So if they were out of sync at the time that the database crashed, or let's say that you're really lazy and when you shut down your database, you simulate a crash, you just make sure all the write-ahead log records are flushed out to disk, and then you don't care if the table data is written because you'll just do it when you do recovery processing at the next database startup. Don't write a database that does that, it's, it's kind of crappy. But you could do that. Um, but redo is supposed to bring everything back into sync. So write-ahead log and table files are in sync with each other. But at the same time, you also find what transactions are not completed yet. So the undo <laughs> phase is do a bulk rollback of all of the transactions that were still in flight at the time that the database system stopped executing, whatever caused it to stop executing. You know, cause, you know solar flare, who knows, okay? So anyway, um, those are the two phases of recovery processing, and you can see how they both rely on the write-ahead log. Once recovery is completed, then both of these things hold. The table files are in sync, and I mean that the table files on disk are in sync with the write-ahead log on disk, and also there are no more incomplete transactions. Everything has a start and then a corresponding commit, or it has a start and then an abort. Okay? Now, the challenge here is that this process can take some time. And we always do it every time we start the database because we never know why it stopped. <laughs> you know, it's just like I said, you get bonked in the head and suddenly you wake up and you're, you don't know where you were before. All you have is whatever little notes you wrote to yourself. And this database is the same way. Maybe it can record, hey, I shut down gracefully and the world is wonderful. So that's when you go to bed and you wake up the next morning and you carry on with your day. But every once in a while you wake up and you don't know why you are where you are or whatever. And so you go check your log and you say, oh, I crashed. And now I need to resume uh, whatever I was doing before. So you could do that in the uh, write-ahead log as well. Okay, so every transaction, every state change performed by the database is recorded in there. And the recovery processing has got to scan through all of that at least the way that we've presented it so far. We start at log record one, and we play it all the way through, and then we unroll or we undo any transaction, so we go backwards until we don't need to anymore. But the problem is this is going to be expensive, and we really don't need to replay the entire log unless our database is like the flakiest thing ever. If we are not crashing all the time, then we have a pretty good likelihood that most of the log records in the write-ahead log are reflected in table files on disk, 
and also that the vast bulk of our transactions are not incomplete. So basically, we just have a few things that we may need to roll back, and we have just a few changes to table pages that we need to make. Okay? So we don't need to replay the entire log file. So a very common approach is to introduce checkpointing, and the checkpoint is a nice little thing where basically you say, this is a point in the write-ahead log file where I can guarantee that my write-ahead log records on disk reflect the table pages on disk. And so what that does is it allows you to say, I don't have to redo anything before this checkpoint. Because at the checkpoint, everything between the logs and the table pages are in sync. It's only stuff afterward that may not be in sync. Okay, so that's the idea behind checkpoint. So yes, uh, it's just like recovery. So checkpoint procedure should bring all table files into sync with the write-ahead log uh, so that that bounds where we need to redo from. Now, a good question to think about is do we need to, uh, or does that place a, a lower bound on where we need to stop undoing? And that's something else to think about. Now, so far, what we're going to do is constrain that nothing else is allowed to write to the database while we do checkpointing. We are allowed to read. We certainly could read stuff while we're checkpointing, but we're not allowed to modify data. And the reason why is because we want checkpointing to give us a good, strong guarantee that after the checkpoint record has been written, all the write-ahead log records are, are in direct correlation with all of the table data on disk. And if we allow writes during that time, then we won't necessarily be able to do that. So here's what the procedure is. The first thing we do is we write out all of the write-ahead log records. And we make sure that they actually hit the platter. So we go ahead, we write them out in order. Um, you probably wouldn't want to write them in any arbitrary order. You'd like to write them out in order. And then sync the log file so that now you know it's on the platter. Next thing you do is you write out all the table pages so you can see that we follow the write-ahead logging rule because none of the table data hits the disk until the write-ahead log reflects all of those changes. But once we've done this step, then we can write a checkpoint record. And notice that the checkpoint record also includes a set of transaction IDs, which is the set of transactions that are incomplete at the point that the checkpoint is performed. So ideally, this now answers our question, um, does the checkpoint set a lower bound on how far back we have to go in the logs to undo transactions? And the answer is, well, unfortunately not the checkpoint record itself. That's not the lower bound. Because we have all these transactions that are in flight, and if any of those are still in flight when the database crashes, we may have to undo writes that are recorded before the checkpoint record. So the checkpoint record says, Everything is in sync at this point, and here's a set of incomplete transactions. Now, they may complete afterward, but they may not. And so if we have a system crash after the checkpoint, but before those transactions have completed, undo processing may have to go before the checkpoint record. But at least it will tell us where we can start redoing from. Okay? Yes? So what's the point of having checkpoints where they Uh, what is the point of having it? Well, basically, uh, redoing is expensive, and so we would like to place a good bound on where we have to redo. Because remember that redoing has to replay every write that occurs to the database. Undoing, we generally only have to undo transactions that are incomplete, and that should be a small set. I will take it as like a first assumption. Mm. Yes. Well, so remember the guarantee that the checkpoint uh, record gives you is that everything before the checkpoint in the write ahead log is reflected in the table files on disk. So we don't have to redo anything from those transactions, even though they're incomplete, we don't have to redo anything from before the checkpoint record, because we're saying the table files on disk already reflect the state changes of those incomplete transactions. We just need to undo anything that uh, incomplete transactions uh, may not have, have uh, been rolled back before the checkpoint. 
And you'll see why we can make this fast in a second, because it turns out that we can get very clever about how we represent our write-ahead logs. But yes, our checkpoint guarantee is really nice. It basically says we don't need to redo anything before that record. Okay, questions? Other questions? All right. Let's see. So yeah, when we see a checkpoint record in the log, then that tells us that we have a guarantee. And so this is basically what I was asking before. Once we have that checkpoint record, are we allowed to ignore all records before the checkpoint? And really, the guarantee only says that we're allowed to ignore them for redo processing. But we're not allowed to ignore them for undo processing because we may have in-flight transactions uh, at the time of crash. Okay? So let's, let's say that uh, you know, L is a set of transaction IDs. The system crashes sometime after the checkpoint. And some subset of that set L is still in flight at the time that the database crashes. Well, in that case, we do need to consider uh, records, write-ahead log records, before the checkpoint because we may need to undo those operations. Okay? That's just the reality that we're dealing with. Okay, so yeah, the database has to keep up. But So this is the nice thing, is that the checkpoint does place a lower bound on the amount of the write-ahead log we have to keep around. You can imagine something else we want to add to this checkpoint. If we knew the point in the log that each transaction's write-ahead log record started at, we could use that as a lower bound. Okay, so we go through all the transaction IDs in L, and we find the, the earliest record that was written for any of those transaction IDs. That's the starting point, or that's the, the furthest point we might need to consider for undo processing. So you could see that we, we could use this as a lower bound as well. Okay. We'll talk about how to do that a little bit more efficiently than this uh, in the future. So yeah, recovery processing does change slightly because you can see that we can infer some details from the checkpoint record. But the problem is we have to find it. <laughs> okay? So our write-ahead log is right, 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 and we have stuff in there. And you know, at various times, we have checkpoint entries in the log. So now we have to go <laughs> find the first checkpoint entry. And you can see that that's going to be a little bit expensive. So it kind of suggests maybe we'd like to actually record the location of that checkpoint record so that we can just go straight to it at recovery time. There's other good reasons why we want to as well. Uh, but anyway, like I say, the database scans backward through the logs to find the most recent checkpoint record. And then it knows that it can redo from that point. So it replays forward, repeats history. But we already know that given that there's a checkpoint record, that the tables and the write-ahead log are in sync from that point forward, or I mean from that point back. So we replay forward. But we also initialize our set of incomplete transactions from what the checkpoint record records. So L is the set of incomplete transactions. So we start there, we go forward, and if we see a commit or abort for any of those transactions in L, we remove them from the incomplete set. We may also see new transactions start. So those need to go into the incomplete set. And if we see a commit or an abort, then we remove them from the incomplete set. Okay, so this is basically what I was just saying. Any questions? So this is the, the wind-up for, for uh, recovery with checkpoints. Then we perform the undo phase. And undo processing doesn't change at all, except that we basically ignore checkpoint records that we may come across. Because those don't really tell us anything that we care about. We look at the set of incomplete transactions, which, remember, may or may not be the same as L, because L is just the starting set of incomplete transactions, and we update it as before. If we see commit or abort, then we remove it, and if we see start, we add it. So we just keep doing that forward, and once we get to the end of the redo phase, we know what transactions need to be rolled back, and then we just go ahead and do that in undo processing. Okay? So we talked about this. And uh, the other thing that I was uh, going to mention is that remember that we have these redo-only records or compensation log records, and we also need to issue aborts when we actually abort these records. Because the whole point of recovery processing is to make sure that the write-ahead log captures that all of these transactions have now been completed. So as we do the, the undo phase, we're also 
writing compensating log records. We're also writing abort entries to record that various transactions are completed. Okay. Now, um, let me see if we actually mention it here. I don't think that I mentioned it necessarily. But uh, the whole point of recovery processing is that tables and write-ahead log are in sync again, right? So what can we do once we finish recovery processing? Write another checkpoint record because we've done a checkpoint. And in that, in that case, um, in recovery processing, the set of incomplete transactions will be empty. So that's one thing that you can sort of do with this checkpointing mechanism is that once you've completed recovery processing, you can just write out another checkpoint record at the end so that, you know, as the database runs on, you never have to do that recovery processing again, you know, if it were to crash after that. Okay, any questions? Let's see, yeah, so no other updates are allowed, so a transaction is updating every record in a very large table. So think about this situation in the context of, of writing a checkpoint out. You see that there's going to be a lot of buffer pages being loaded and then marked dirty because they have changes to them. And like I say here, the changes aren't required to be flushed until commit. But then, of course, you have a checkpoint occur. And, well, what does the checkpoint require? <laughs> Everything in the write-ahead log and everything in the table files on disk need to be in sync with each other. So basically, all these dirty table pages that we've been accumulating in memory that before we wouldn't have to have written out, now we have to write them out because we have to make sure that everything gets updated properly. And like I was saying, we're doing all this I.O. because we have to write out all these pages. We have to make sure the write-ahead log and table files are in sync with the current state of the database system. And even little tiny writes will be blocked in these situations. So unfortunately, that is the one drawback of checkpointing. It's nice, except that checkpointing is kind of like the garbage collection pause that you sometimes see in programming languages, where everything has to stop. Now, you can still read, but everything else has to stop until checkpointing is completed. All right? Now, it turns out that it is possible to do a couple of things to mitigate this. First of all, you can actually make sure that checkpoints never incur more than some upper bound on I.O. costs by keeping track of how many pages are dirty. And so you might say, well, I want to perform a checkpoint every time that I have more than 50 pages dirty or more than 200 pages dirty. And that way, you can pretty much guarantee that checkpoints will provide a, a pretty uh, reasonable upper bound on, on performance impact. So that's one thing that you can do. You can, again, make your buffer manager intelligent. Every time a page is modified and you record it dirty, well, go ahead and keep track of that and write checkpoints periodically when, when pages get dirty. A lot of databases do this. Like Postgres totally does this. When you accumulate a number, a certain number of writes, issue a checkpoint so that your checkpoints never become too expensive. Now, another thing that you can do, which is kind of unusual, is that you can make your checkpoints less rigorous than what we've described so far. You can actually have checkpoints that don't provide the same guarantee that we've described. And what it allows you to do is to update any data pages that are not actually involved in the checkpoint procedure, which would be another reason why we'd like to maintain an upper bound on how many pages become dirty, because let's say that we have 50 pages. Well, those 50 pages become involved in a checkpoint operation, but if it's a fuzzy checkpoint, transactions can go and write to other pages, and it's okay. So let's look at how fuzzy checkpoints would work. Okay. Now, like I say here, we require that updates are blocked while the write-ahead log records are being output and while the checkpoint records are written. But we, we do two things. One is that, like it says here, you allow modified table pages to be written to disk after the checkpoint record is written. So if we allow modified table pages to be written out after the checkpoint record, you can see that the guarantee that a checkpoint provides is now different. Okay. What was the whole point of the checkpoint record? Yeah. Yeah, so that's exactly right. The checkpoint record is supposed to guarantee that the write-ahead log on disk is in sync with the table files on disk. 
But if we allow the table files to be written out after the checkpoint record is written out, now our checkpoint doesn't give us a guarantee. So, how do we deal with this? Well, it turns out that there's a relatively straightforward change you can make. So now here's our, ch our fuzzy checkpoint procedure. We write out all the write-ahead log records in memory, and we sync it. And remember, we're not allowing any updates while this occurs. So we're not generating new write-ahead log records. We're just outputting the ones that we've accumulated. And then we output this checkpoint L record again. And again, L is the set of incomplete transactions at the point that the checkpoint record is, is written. Okay. So now our checkpoint record doesn't give us the same guarantee as before. Finally, we write out all the modified table pages to disk. I should basically say all of the mo modified table pages that are covered by the write-ahead log records. Because we do allow writes to other pages outside of this modified page set uh, after the check checkpoint. Okay. So yeah, like I said, the checkpoint record isn't as strong because now basically we need to complete this last step before our checkpoint really becomes the guarantee. And that's why we call it a fuzzy checkpoint. Um, the first two steps make a promise. <laughs> the first step writes out write-ahead log records, and then the second step writes a checkpoint record, but the promise doesn't hold that the checkpoint record guarantees what you say it guarantees. And so we have to complete this third step before that checkpoint record means what you, you want it to mean. That's why it's called fuzzy. So um, basically, like I say here, the checkpoint is just incomplete. And so what we do is we have a different location. And so this is where you end up with a checkpoint file where basically you say, I'm going to record the last checkpoint I actually completed. And that goes in this checkpoint file. So like it says here, so, so we do this our thing. We write out the write-ahead log as much as we can. Nobody's allowed to do anything while we're doing this. So we write out the write-ahead log. We write our checkpoint record. That checkpoint does not give us any guarantees yet. But that's OK, because it's not in our last checkpoint field, which is in a different file, which we can update atomically. So that checkpoint record doesn't mean anything yet. We start writing out all the table pages that are dirty, that are covered by that checkpoint. This is also where we start allowing transactions to modify things, but they can't write them back to disk yet. So we go ahead and we allow those, or we write out those table pages. Once we complete writing out all those table pages, now our checkpoint record means something. Because the write ahead log on disk is in sync with all the table files on disk. We've written them all out, so now we update our last checkpoint value to say, I've completed the checkpoint. You can now trust it. Now this has a second benefit. We don't have to hunt for the last valid checkpoint anymore because it's recorded in this separate file. We know this is the point in the write-ahead log where we had our last valid checkpoint record and we can go ahead and use that. Okay, does that make sense? Now what happens if we lose this last checkpoint value? Kind of pointless. Because then you don't have any, you, you don't have any guarantee of which checkpoint is the one that is valid. So then you can have a bunch of checkpoint records that you don't know which one is the last one that actually. Yeah, if we lose this last checkpoint value, we're kind of really hosed. That's like <laughs> that. That's disaster time. Um, because yeah, your checkpoint records don't mean as much anymore, and so you lose since you lost the guarantee. You can't just hunt for them and use them. So you lose this file or you lose this data and you are in trouble. So you can see that now you're placing your eggs, all of your eggs, in a very uh, small basket. So you just hope that you never lose that file. Okay. There's ways of mitigating that. Um, there's other interesting things uh, about this as well. We're talking about pushing out all the write-ahead log entries. Okay. So let's say that the database has 15 pages worth of write-ahead log entries that it has accumulated, and each page is 4 kilobytes, and let's say that we're on a disk that isn't awesome and modern, so it still has 512-byte sectors as opposed to 4-kilobyte sectors, which is becoming more and more common. 
So we issue these rights, 15 pages, each one having a bunch of sectors in it, let's say eight sectors in it. We write these all out, and then we say, sync it. But the problem is, while we're writing it out, the system crashes. So I have a question for you. Do you have any guarantees about which pages would have been written and what order they're written in? Yes, I'm seeing shaking heads, and that is the correct answer. Unfortunately, the operating system is allowed to reorder your rights. Which is another thing that if you're designing a database system, makes you want to shoot yourself. Okay? Because you say, I'd like to write out these 15 pages of write-ahead log records, and it crashes somewhere in there. It does not mean that you can trust that 1 through i made it, and i plus 1 through n didn't make it. The database, or not the database, but the operating system or the disk itself may reorder those writes to be in some other order. So unfortunately what that means is that this kind of checkpoint file becomes useful in other ways as well. Because you'd like to know at what point can you actually trust that your write-ahead log is actually written to disk. And so a lot of times what you also do in here is you keep a record of what was the last write-ahead log entry that I successfully wrote and then synced to disk. Because everything after that you kind of can't trust. Everybody see why? Because you may have said, I want to write 25 or 50 pages of write-ahead log records, and the operating system is like, whatever, you know, life is cool, I don't care. And so it's just writing stuff out in whatever order makes sense for the disk, but not necessarily for the write-ahead log. You can't necessarily trust that the, the things underneath the database won't reorder your writes. And so again, to deal with that issue, you can always guarantee that once you get you issue the F-sync, it's all there. But before that point, you don't know what order it might have hit. So sometimes, well, not sometimes, it's often very helpful in this checkpoint file to also record the last known good point in your write-ahead log so that you know that you can trust before that point, but not after that point. All right? Well, that's not the last checkpoint, actually. What you can think of it is as being the last, the last, I'm trying to think of the right way of saying it, the, the offset in the write-ahead log that you performed your last f-sync on. And given that you have to f-sync every time you write a commit record, it ends up being the last point that you committed. Because remember, if we're going to have durable transactions, i.e. our commit records mean something, <laughs> then we need to make sure that we sync after every commit. And if we sync after every commit, then we can just go ahead and record the log, the log offset in this right at, you know in this checkpoint file, and then we know that we can at least trust up to that point. And afterward, who knows? But since it's only in complete transactions, who cares? Okay. As long as we find, uh, follow the right ahead logging rule, we're always okay. All right. So there's some really interesting nuances here. Um, this is why I love this stuff because it's like, how do you actually use all of this hardware and software that is not completely reliable to create a system that you know provides these durability guarantees and so forth. That's why transaction processing is such an interesting topic. Okay, yeah, so last checkpoint value on disk. So we talked about this. Yeah, the, the uh, database collects all the dirty table pages at the time that it performs the checkpoint. So it just goes through and finds them all, and it can write them out in whatever order it wants. It doesn't really care. So it can do it in some optimal way that, that uh, reduces disk seeks. Once all of those pages are written out and the corresponding files are synced, then it can go ahead and update that last checkpoint value to point to the most recent checkpoint record. And it turns out that it's relatively easy to prevent other transactions. Do I talk about this here or is it on the next slide? Let me see. Yeah, so right ahead logging rule. I think that I talk about it on this slide. So during a fuzzy checkpoint, dirty buffer page is collected to be output to disk. Okay. So we know that this page is modified, and we know that we have write-ahead log entries for it. So we wrote those write-ahead log entries out. Now we need to write the buffer page, and now somebody else wants to write to that page. Well, since we're not really allowed to generate write-ahead log entries yet, we can't allow that write to occur yet. 
So basically, we have to postpone transactions that want to write to the dirty page set of the checkpoint. That's the one constraint that we have to follow. Now, if a um, transaction wants to write to some other page, that's totally fine. We don't allow it to hit the disk yet, but um, we at least allow them to start writing to it in memory. So that's the one little uh, you know, wrinkle about fuzzy checkpoints. Now, this is an easy thing to do, because what you can do is just acquire a read lock on all the pages in the dirty page set for the checkpoint. And that way, other transactions can read the written data, but they're not allowed to write to them. So that's the easy way of in enforcing this constraint. OK? Let's see. Now, uh, like I say, your long-running transactions do cause issues, because basically, um, remember that checkpoints say everything is in sync at this point. Okay. So basically, the checkpoint says, and let's say that it's a completed checkpoint, so we're talking about uh, regardless of if it's fuzzy or not, um, that it is a completed checkpoint. So we have a guarantee that the write-ahead log and the table files are in sync with each other. So we don't need to redo anything before that checkpoint, but we do need to undo stuff before that checkpoint. And so if you have a long-running transaction that's modifying a lot of different things, then unfortunately, we may have to go way far back into the past to un undo that transaction if the database happens to crash. Our checkpoints basically give us no benefit for undo processing. Okay? Does that, everybody see that? So our checkpointing really only helps with redo. It does not help us with undo. Okay? Any questions? Because now we're going to start talking about an even cooler transaction processing system. Has anybody heard of ARIES in the context of transaction processing? Very cool research paper. Uh, if you read one research paper in your life, probably it should be something else, but... Um, this is a really good one if you're curious about logging and recovery. It's so good. Um, it's a, it's a, uh, basically a, a write-ahead logging mechanism that was designed by IBM. You can see it was designed in 1992. It is used virtually everywhere. It's used by operating systems for doing metadata logging in their journaling file systems. It's used in many different databases. NanoDB even has a very simplified version of ARIES implemented in it. So you see algorithm for recovery and isolation exploiting semantics. There's so many things it can do. It can do row level locking or row level uh, transaction updates. So that um, one of the things that's challenging about transaction processing in the context of concurrent access is that we work at a granularity of a disk page. So if I'm a transaction and I write to a disk page, I kind of can't allow other transactions to write or read that disk page concurrently, even though they may be looking at different tuples in the same page. Because remember that we really only record what changes in that page. So ARIES introduces a mechanism to allow row-level locking. And part of how it does it is by allowing us to record um, deltas in other ways besides just here's the old version of the data and here's the new version of the data. You can say, I incremented this value by 1. I added 50. I removed 50. And that allows you to accumulate log entries in different orders, and so transactions can be interleaved in more interesting ways. So there's some really interesting details there. Um, also, you have situations where um, I don't have it here. It's too bad. I think I talk about it in the future. You can have operations that uh, can't really be rolled back, like creating files, dropping files, extending disk page or uh, files to have more, more uh, pages in them. All of these kinds of operations, there's, you don't always want to be able to roll those back. So um, ARIES supports those kinds of things as well. So there's a lot of interesting things ARIES can do. We will introduce only the most basic concepts. And even this will be more sophisticated than what uh, we do in NanoDB. But if you want to implement something cool for third term, ARIES would be a great idea to go ahead and extend it, to add checkpointing and fuzzy checkpointing to NanoDB. It shouldn't be that difficult. I think that is definitely within one term's worth of work. OK, now um, we talked about how in checkpointing, we need to record where did the checkpoint occur. And we need to record various details. So a lot of um, aspects of ARIES come down to this concept of a log sequence number, which we abbreviate LSN. 
log sequence number. And this is basically just a particular uh, reference to a specific write-ahead log record. And like I say, the record's offset in the log file is fine. Um, the one issue is that we roll over these logs. Okay, so like I say, uh, we can't have large logs. And so what we do is we say logs can grow up to 100 megabytes or 10 megabytes or whatever the constraint might be. And when we hit the upper bound, then we roll over to the next log file. And so you have some number that keeps incrementing for each log file number. And so what you end up with is a log sequence number that captures the log file number and the offset within that log file. That is an LSN. You can think of it as being very sim similar to a, a pointer to a tuple in a table page or an index record or something like that. Okay? But these log sequence numbers basically record an entry in the log file that you could then go to to see the corresponding log entry. Okay? Now, like I say here, NanoDB doesn't do this optimization, but it's a pretty obvious one. If I have references within a log file, go ahead and just use the offset. Because the vast majority of log records are going to refer to other log records in the same file. But the log records at the beginning of a file may need to refer to log records in the previous file, and so you would have some simple way of doing that kind of situation. But that's, that's kind of the idea, is that you can do a simple optimization there. Now, like I say, here's a couple of current concurrent transactions. We won't get more complex than this. You can see that we've transferred $50 from A to B, and that one is committed, so that, that transaction is complete. And another transaction is not complete yet, transferring $100 from C to D. We have uh, deducted from C, and we've added to D, but we have not committed it yet. Now, records have implicit log sequence numbers, just their offsets within the file. We don't store them in the record itself, because that would be dumb. But every record also has a field saying, what is the corresponding previous log sequence number for the previous record in this transaction? What will this be good for? If I know, if for any given log record, I know the previous log record for that transaction, what can I now do really efficiently? Yeah, rollbacks become super fast. Because I always know exactly where to go to get to the next record for that transaction. So you can see T37 commit. Now, I wouldn't roll back T37. So let's start with T40, uh, three, you know, LSN321. So it says the previous entry for this transaction is LSN267. So I hop back there. The previous one is 262. So you can just always hop backward very easily. Okay, so abort for T40. So this is just uh, describing what I just had. So start with the lo uh, last log record for T40. And you'll notice again that when you have transaction state in the database, we usually record the last log sequence number for that transaction. So that when it's time to roll it back, it's really easy to go right to the entry in the uh, log file to roll that transaction back. Okay, that's another thing that NanoDB does. It's very simple. And so we record the last log record for each transaction in flight. And we see that we have to uh, go through these records. So we issue compensation log records when we roll things back. Because remember, that simplifies both redo and undo processing. We talked about that briefly last lecture. So we change D from 100 to 200. We have to roll it back to 100. So we issue a compensation log record that has a pre-LSN of the thing we just updated. Now we have another field that we have in uh, compensation log records. You'll notice that since they have to store less data, we can embellish things a little bit by adding a little bit more uh, information. So we have another entry in our under our uh, redo only record that says this is the next thing that needs to be undone. So you'll notice that we have uh, LSN 321 says LSN 267 is the next thing that we have to undo. And so in our compensation log record, we also record 267 is the next thing we have to undo <laughs> in our log. Okay? So continuing this example, we wrote out T40D100, so that's a compensation log record. We're ready to now undo LSN267. We issue another compensation log record, which says next thing in, in line is 262. And you can see how they're all chained together. 
And then we finally hit the start record. We issue an abort record. And then we're done. That transaction is now rolled back. OK, any questions? You can see that this allows us to be much more efficient with finding records in the write-ahead log that we need. All we did was we added a little tiny bit of structure to our logs. And again, you can see how this is basically exactly like a linked list or, or a, a directed acyclic graph that you might build in memory, except we're doing this all with file offsets and so forth, which is both really neat and also a huge pain in the butt to debug, as you may already know. <laughs> so you'll definitely see this in both assignments five and six, because unfortunately we have file system data structures in both. Okay, so anyway, T40 is now rolled back. Now, data pages also have a really interesting thing, which hopefully we'll uh, get through most of the discussion of. But uh, data pages also have a log sequence number associated with them. And what these log sequence numbers represent is the most recent operation performed to that page. Because if you think about it, the write-ahead log records, each one just records a state change to the database. And so if we have state changes being recorded, we can also, in the pages themselves, record this is the record that corresponds to the state change that leads me to my current state. And so you can see that the page LSN, now being part of the data page, is also persisted to disk. But the interesting thing about that is you'll notice we have page LSNs in the buffer manager that are updated as operations occur. But we may have different LSNs in the pages that are recorded on disk. Which page is clean? Which page has not been written to since the last time it was, it was stored? Does everybody see how easy this is to determine? If the LSN in memory is the same as the LSN on disk, the page is clean. But if the LSN in memory is further than the LSN on disk, then the page is dirty and we have both write-ahead log entries that could be recorded, maybe they were written out, we don't know, but also the page itself needs to be written out. Okay? Um, now, obviously, we don't go check the LSN on disk just to see if we need to do that. It turns out that this is most useful in recovery processing. Okay? Um, but we're able to, to use these things to great value. Okay. Uh, let's see, what else do I need to talk about here? Okay, so the page LSN, just like I was saying, most recent write-ahead log record that's been applied to the page. So during recovery processing, very interesting detail. We can use that LSN to tell what records have been applied to the page and which ones have not been applied to the page. And this is useful because of what I was describing before. Um, first of all, we don't need to apply them. They've already been applied. But also, sometimes we have apply once records. And so we use the LSN as a simple mechanism to tell, have I already applied this record to the page? And if it's a, an apply once record, we don't want to apply it multiple times. Okay. And this is what I was describing before, that we have to be able to maintain this property called idempotence, where we can basically crash and recover, crash and recover, crash and recover, and it still produces the same results in the database system. So being able to have these LSNs associated with data pages allows us to do that effectively, and it gives us more flexibility in the kinds of operations we can log to the write-ahead log. Okay? Now, we don't go into much detail here about this, but you can certainly refer to the research paper, and it will go into more detail about that. Basically, all the, all the operations we describe in class and all the operations we have to log in NanoDB all can be applied multiple times just because we keep it simple. <laughs> All right? Now, the last thing that's recorded is this thing called a dirty page table. And basically, this keeps track of additional details about dirty pages. <laughs> and this thing also turns out to be incredibly useful for recovery processing. Okay? So we have the ID of the dirty page, which, as we all now uh, know from the buffer manager, includes both the file name and the block number. I made that error when I uh, tried to create that other piece of code. Uh, we have the in-memory page LSN for the dirty page. So that's the 
log sequence number of the write ahead log entry that reflects the most recent state change for that page. Everything up to that point has been applied to the page in memory. And then we also have another LSN record that says this is when the page became dirty. Do people see how we could use that? If we have to do redo processing, well, that becomes a lower bound. And if we have to do undo processing, it also becomes a lower bound. Okay, like I said here, when the page is flushed from the buffer manager, so that means that all the write ahead log entries have been applied, because we have to follow the wall rule. And then we write the page itself back to disk. So that page LSN is written. Well, we can now remove it from the dirty page table. And we don't need a rec LSN anymore because it's clean. Rec LSN is only for dirty pages. OK, so this is our previous example. Okay, so we have uh, our two pages that we're considering and our log, which is basically identical to what it was before. We only have one dirty page. Now, we know that because we're eyeballing all of this and our brains are very clever, but we look and we say, oh, page one's page LSN matches both in memory and on disk. So we know it must not be dirty. But page two has two different LSN values. So we know that page two is dirty. Okay, we can just infer that. Now, the page LSN value, this should be in our page table. Remember, that's just the most recent log sequence number. So in our dirty page table entry for page 2, page LSN will be 362. Right? What will rec LSN be? Will it be 321? What will rec LSN be for that uh, page 2? Well, just ask yourself the question, what write-ahead log entry made that page dirty? So we can sort of roll back in our minds in time when the disk version of page 2 was in sync with the in-memory version of page 2, then they were in sync. The page wasn't dirty. So 321 was where it was no longer dirty. And now we have 362, and so the question is, what other operations occurred on that page that could cause it to become dirty? Yeah, so 321, we write to D, 339 shouldn't affect it. 344, like Juan Diego said. Now we have 362 as well. That wrote to it as well, but hey, we have two writes. 344 is where it became dirty. So that's the value that actually goes into the uh, rec LSN entry for the dirty page table. Yeah, so page 2 on disk has two initial writes from T40, but we have two more writes that we haven't recorded yet. So um, LSN 344 is where that occurs. Questions? Okay. So this may be the last thing that we can talk about here. Like I say here, what can we discern from the rec LSN value recorded in the dirty page table with respect to recovery processing? This is what I was saying before. If we have a given rec LSN, that's where it became dirty. That's the furthest back that we have to go to undo the changes in that page. So let's say we had like 15 pages in our dirty page table. We could just look for the smallest rec LSN value of any of those entries, and that would be the furthest back that we have to go to undo changes in the page table. I mean, in the uh, database. Everybody got that? If we have records that are before that, uh, the oldest rec LSN value, we can throw those logs away. We don't need them anymore. Because everything else will be uh, in, already reflected in the pages on disk. So yeah, this becomes very, very helpful. Okay, let's see. What else can we talk about here? Uh, checkpoints. Um, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to talk about checkpoints, but just to set up for next time, because I do want to go through this. It's quite fascinating how it works. Um, Ares has fuzzy checkpoints, um, but they're like badass fuzzy checkpoints. We're only going to go into a little bit of detail about them. But this checkpoint record includes a lot of useful information. Just as before, we include the IDs of all incomplete transactions. 
But we don't just record the IDs of the transactions, we also record the last LSN for each incomplete transaction. Again, that tells us where we need to resume in our processing. So we can use that in recovery processing. We also record the dirty page table. So remember, the checkpoint has a certain number of pages that are incomplete. You know, or I shouldn't say incomplete. They're dirty. They haven't been written out to disk yet. So we have a dirty page table, which doesn't just include the LSNs of the pages, but it also includes the LSNs of where the pages became dirty. And so all of that stuff is written out as well. Okay? And so like I say here, we write and flush all in-memory log records, and then we write and flush the checkpoint record to disk. And then, of course, we have to start taking care of cleaning up after our fuzzy checkpoint. Okay? Uh, are there any questions at this point? All right, so next time we'll go ahead and complete our, our discussion of ARIES because I, wanted, I want everybody to see how uh, we can use this information to do fuzzy checkpoints. So we'll talk about that on Friday.